Hey, welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. This season we're discussing issues that I personally wrestle with with regard to the faith, and today we'll look at one of the most important questions, how righteous do we need to be? How much of the right thing do we need to do in order to be accepted into heaven? Jesus' words on this topic are pretty sobering. For I tell you that unless your justice abound more than that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5.20 The word abound sounds pretty threatening, but there's no way this could refer to how much influence your justice has, since for the most part that's beyond your control. Instead, it means how much justice you have. This means that the Pharisees were unjust in some way, and over the course of the Gospels, Jesus raises many issues with the conduct of the Pharisees. For now, let's mention just three major ones. For they bind heavy and unsupportable burdens and lay them on men's shoulders, but with a finger of their own they will not move them. Matthew 23, 4 The Pharisees made big demands of other people but they weren't willing to go out of their way to help others, and this is one reason why Jesus called them hypocrites. And they love the first places at feasts, and the first chairs in the synagogues, and salutations in the marketplace, and to be called by men, Rabbi. Matthew 23, 6-7 The Pharisees loved to be thought of highly by other people. They enjoyed prestige, and they did what was needed to make that happen. Woe to you blind guides that say, Whosoever shall swear by the temple it is nothing, but he that shall swear by the gold of the temple is a debtor. Matthew twenty three sixteen. The Pharisees cared more about money than about honesty and faithfulness to the law of God. This is at the root of a specific issue that Jesus raised against them. For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and he that shall curse father or mother dying, let him die. But you say... If a man shall say to his father or mother, Corban, which is a gift, whatsoever is from me shall profit thee. And further, you suffer him not to do anything for his father or mother, making void the word of God by your own tradition, which you have given forth. And many other such like things you do. Mark seven ten to 13 What Jesus is accusing the Pharisees of here is violations of the law of God when it came to caring for your elderly parents. Some people had made the decision to give money to the temple instead of to their old parents who needed the support more. This was against the law of God, but the Pharisees had supported these decisions because obviously they wanted the money more than they wanted the law of God to be obeyed. Now, if a person craves money and prestige, but isn't willing to make an effort to help their fellow man deal with their burdens and other problems, that paints a picture of a man who far from being religious, is just sort of using religion as a means of gaining social power, wealth, and fame, and perhaps political influence as well. King Herod himself did this when he rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem. So Jesus is warning his disciples that compromising on the law of God for the purpose of gaining worldly wealth and power is not sufficient. The modern-day career Catholic who builds their career off of the faith and makes a living keeping the church's economic functions going but who refuses to stand by the church's teaching on tough moral issues like homosexual sex and contraception would be an example of Pharisee-like people in the modern time. Still, that's something of a low bar. Did Jesus say anything else about how much justice we need? Be you therefore perfect, as also your heavenly Father is perfect. Matthew five forty-eight. Now, this verse requires some unpacking. Obviously, we can't take this literally because our Heavenly Father is perfect in power, perfect in wisdom and knowledge, and perfect in that he never needed to be created. He's also perfect in that he never had any sin, neither personal sin nor original sin, and in fact, he's perfect in that he's the very standard of goodness himself. None of us is even remotely capable of being perfect in any of these ways, with the exception of Mary, who was sinless. However, even Mary isn't all-powerful, all-knowing, all-wise, the standard of goodness, or uncreated. Obviously, for God to demand that we have types of perfection that aren't available to us would be unfair, and therefore imperfect, and therefore not worthy of God. So he must not be doing that here. Instead, this must refer to a type of perfection which God has, and which human beings can also possess. There are a couple of types that are like this. 
For instance, God freely acts for the benefit of others, and we can do that also. God wants everyone to be saved, and we also can work out of a will to save as many people as possible. However, neither our actions for the benefit of others, nor our desire to save all people, are going to be as perfect as those that God has. There is, however, another thing about God that we can emulate, holiness. God's holiness makes it impossible for him to disobey or compromise the truth or the divine law. We also can refuse to disobey or compromise the truth of the divine law. God's holiness makes it impossible for him to be contaminated by the stain of any sin. We also can be purified of our sins by being baptized or by receiving the sacraments of confession or the anointing of the sick properly. However, some people think it's enough to just be devoted to Jesus and believe in him. Not every one that saith to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doth the will of my Father who is in heaven, he shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have not we prophesied in thy name, and cast out devils in thy name, and done many miracles in thy name? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. Matthew seven twenty one to 23 These verses refer to those who claim to be spiritual, who do great deeds in the name of God, but who refuse to confront their own sins and sinful tendencies, or who reject certain parts of the law of God and or teach others to reject them. The part about those who work iniquity is especially helpful in clarifying this, since it refers specifically to the things that a person does their sins, and their refusal to repent, instead of trying to make up for their evil doing with good works, which isn't enough. In many ways, this is like the Pharisees. So, the amount of righteousness that we need is a willingness to learn and obey the law of God, to work towards the salvation of souls as God wants us to, rather than just working to exalt ourselves in this life, and to willingly confront our own sins and correct our disagreements with the law of God. We should also willingly seek to be purified of our sins, through the sacraments, while also doing our best to avoid serious sin. This is what's needed to be admitted into heaven. Next, what does it mean to be penitent? That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.